Okay, hi everybody. Um, we're moving into chapter six, which deals with chemical equilibrium. Um, there are three topics here. In the first video, we'll talk about the equilibrium constant. I hope to give you some more details about, I think, some equations, ideas that you hopefully know from Gen Chem. Uh, second or third video here, we'll talk about the response of equilibrium to changes in conditions. And uh, there's also a component of Atkins that we're not gonna talk about, which is electrochemistry. Interesting stuff, but beyond what we're gonna cover here. So I, I wanna start by telling you something that I, I hope that you already know. Right? I hope these are some Gen Chem ideas that are familiar to you. Equilibrium constants are ways that we use to describe the equilibrium composition of a system. It's a unitless number between zero and infinity. And uh, specifically, if I have some equilibrium or reaction, A going to B, if the equilibrium constant is greater than one, that means the products are favored. If the equilibrium constant is less than one, that means the reactants are favored. I hope that's all familiar to you. But I wanna, at the very beginning, make an important point to you. Um, and that's the following. Imagine two reactions, A going to B and C going to D. For one of these reactions, we might say the products are strongly favored. And for another one, we might say something different, the products are weakly favored. And I want to pause here and make a point to you. Um, I've commented before that I think the liberal arts are a really great environment to study science. Uh, drawing things, building things, and writing is really important. I haven't actually done this um, formally. I've done it informally, but I have my own set of rules for scientific writing. And rule number four is that all comparisons have to be explicit. Right? Um, and so this language might not have bothered you qualitatively, um, but it's not very clear, right? You're saying it's strongly favored or weakly favored, but compared to what? Is this compared to the reactants? Compared to another reaction, to some theoretical prediction? What? We don't know. Uh, we need to make it explicit. And so when we talk about equilibrium, what we're actually comparing it to is implied, right? And what we really mean is that the products are strongly favored compared to the standard state, right? or they're weakly favored compared to the standard state. The main point that I wanna to make to you here at the very outset is that equilibrium constants are used to describe the equilibrium composition of the system at a specific set of conditions, right? which we refer to as the standard state. And that is important to keep in mind. Once you really understand that and start to get the implications of those nuances, it gets to be a really, really powerful idea. And we'll start to dig into that now. So um, here's our starting point. Let's imagine some gas phase equilibrium A going to B. Uh, we know that to describe equilibrium, we are gonna think about the Gibbs energy. And so what we're gonna do is make a plot that probably looks something like this. Uh, here's the Gibbs energy. This is pure A, this is pure B. This is some description of the composition of the system. A might be at some high Gibbs energy, B might be at some lower one, and there's some line connecting those two. The first thing to point out to you is that the spot that we're looking for on this plot is right here. This point right here is the minimum of G. It is also where delta G equals zero. And those two criteria right, are our definition of equilibrium. So if I can back out where this point is, 
I can figure out what the equilibrium composition of the system is. All right. The way the system gets there um, is by changing the number of moles of uh, component A or component B. Right? And they're connected through the chemical potential. Uh, so this is an idea that we introduced last chapter. It's a basic expression that a system can lower its energy by changing its composition to a lower chemical potential species. The trick here is how do we handle these coupled changes in A and B? Meaning, if I lose A, I make B, that they're coupled together. And the way you do that is by introducing a new variable called the extent of reaction. Here's how uh, the extent of reaction is defined. Okay. Uh, it is essentially related to the uh, change in the moles of some component. The coefficient here, this new sub i, is the stoichiometry number. And so if I were to look at this specific reaction up here, um, we call that for products, stoichiometry numbers are positive. So the stoichiometry number for B is positive 1. And the stoichiometry number for A in this reaction is negative 1. Okay. And if I use those expressions then to define the extent of reaction, it is equal to negative dNA or positive dNB. In essence, the extent of reaction uh, describes a measure of the amount of the reaction in terms of a single variable. It lets me deal with these couple changes. And what's relevant is that the x-axis here, when we talked about composition, what we're really talking about is this extent of reaction, xi. Okay, so um, I can take that definition and I can start plugging some things in. Again, here's my plot. This is my expression for the change in Gibbs energy. Rather than expressing this in terms of Na and Nb, I can now insert my extent of reaction, d xi. Uh, I factor things off and I, I look at expression like this. What you recognize is that the minimum of this curve corresponds to a derivative of G with respect to Xi. So when I define that derivative, um, you get DG D Xi is mu B minus mu A. And what I hope to convince you of is that this is in fact equal to delta G of the reaction. So let me pause and show you something. Consider a couple different scenarios. The first one is if mu A is greater than mu B. If mu A is bigger than mu B, this slope is going to be negative. We're going to be in this region of the graph. And what that's going to tell you is that the system will funnel towards the equilibrium composition. It's gonna go down here. In other words, it will make more B. Another way to say that is that the system evolves from a state of high chemical potential, A, to one of lower chemical potential, B. Last but not least, if A mu A is bigger than mu B, you get a negative delta G. Negative delta G corresponds to spontaneous forward reactions. So these are all internally consistent. The exact opposite is true if mu B is bigger than mu A. In this case, the slope is positive. You're up here in this region. The system is gonna funnel you down this way, which is to say that you're gonna make more A. Again, the system is evolving from a state of high chemical potential to a state of lower chemical potential. And mathematically, uh, you now have a positive delta G, which corresponds to a reverse, a spontaneous reverse reaction. Last but not least, you might have a condition where mu B is equal to mu A. And when that's true, delta G is zero. That is equilibrium. And this is consistent with our previous definition of equilibrium in terms of the chemical potential. 
we said chemical uh, equilibrium was the state in which the chemical potential is equal throughout the system. So these are all internally consistent, different ways to say the same thing. This is the power of chemical potential. Um, all we need at this point is a way to describe the chemical potential of a gas. And I'm, I'm not going to go into all the gory details, but I'll try and quickly summarize it for you. This is the starting point. Um, we take our definition of the chemical potential. It's the molar Gibbs energy. And I have this expression um, from the natural equation for dG. If I look at constant temperature with an ideal gas, I can make a Vm substitution and I get something which looks like this. Um, d mu is RT over P dP. And then I integrate this expression and I end up with something that looks like this. Mu minus mu zero equals RT natural log P over P standard. Again, I want to emphasize this point to you, right? This is Peterson's rule for scientific writing. We are making our, exp our comparisons explicit. We are measuring equilibrium relative to the standard state. In the case of gas phase reactions, the standard state is P standard equal to one bar by definition, right? That is the definition of the standard state. All right, I plug this expression then um, in terms of the reaction that I have. So I have a gas phase reaction A going to B. I get an expression like this for the chemical potential of A. Mu A is mu A standard, RT natural log PA over P standard. I get a similar expression for B. I then take the previously derived equation for delta G. Delta G is mu B minus mu A. And you plug some things in, um, mu B standard minus mu A standard, RT natural log, I can combine these things. We typically write this equation as follows then. Delta RG is equal to delta RG standard plus RT ln Q. Uh, Q, sorry, delta RG standard is the standard change in Gibbs energy. This is a quantity that you can look up and calculate from the standard Gibbs energies of formation, which are in the back of Atkins. Q is the reaction quotient. And this reaction is defined as the partial pressure of B divided by the partial pressure of A. And what I want to emphasize to you is that the partial pressures here refer to the instantaneous pressure, whatever the system is currently at, not the equilibrium pressure. Once the system achieves equilibrium, delta RG is zero. Uh, so I plug in zero, and now I have not the instantaneous pressures, but the equilibrium pressures. And if you're a note-taking person, um, write this down. We can simplify this expression as follows. Delta RG standard equals minus RT ln natural log. <laughs> Delta RG standard equals minus RT ln K. Thank you. Where K is the equilibrium constant. This is the important equation. Um, I hope you've seen this before in Gen Chem, and this is where it all comes from. So some quick comments. In general, equilibrium constants have this form of products over reactants, right? some measure of the composition of the products divided by the reactants. It's important because it tells you about the equilibrium composition of the system at the standard state. When P is one bar. If KEQ is greater than one, natural log of something bigger than one is positive, delta RG is negative, the products are favored. This is consistent with this notion of products divided by reactants. Conversely, if KEQ is less than one, the natural log of a fractional number is negative, negative negative is positive, equals delta RG. And so delta RG standard is positive, and now the reactants are favored. These are bigger than the products. So these are all qualitative notions. 
you actually have to get into a more technical definition of how you define equilibrium constants. Um, and here is for some arbitrary reaction, A moles of A, B of B, going to C, C, and D, D. You can read the gory details in Atkins, but the equilibrium constant expression looks like this. It's products divided by reactants, which are raised to the stoichiometry number. And what I want to emphasize to you is that in all of these cases, these pressures are measured relative to the standard state. It's always P divided by P bar. And if you do all of this right, you get a unitless equilibrium constant. One last comment to kind of go full circle. Um, again, equilibrium constants are defined for this one set of conditions, the standard conditions. And the first point I would make to you is that the choice of standard conditions depends on the specific problem at hand. Right? Uh, an aqueous electrochemistry problem is different than a gas phase reaction. Here are the common standard states that are used. Right? So gases, we have the pure gas at one bar. Uh, liquids, we have the pure liquid. Solids, pure solid. If I have an aqueous species, the standard state is a one molar concentration. And if I have an acid-base reaction, the standard state is pH 7. So you always have to um, note what standard state you're talking about. I hope this is an idea that you saw in Gen Chem. Um, but if I have a equilibrium involving a solid or liquid and a gas, those solids and liquids are not contributing meaningfully to the pressure of the system. Okay. And therefore, terms for the liquid and solid species do not appear in expressions for KEQ. You get no solids or gases in those expressions. And last but not least, um, sometimes people choose different standard states. So sometimes different standard conditions are used for the same type of problem. The most common example of this is, is sometimes called KC versus KP. KP refers to a pressure basis, one bar. KC refers to a concentration basis, one molar. And because those standard states are different, the equilibrium constants are different. Qualitatively, the interpretations are exactly the same. So even if you choose a different standard state, the qualitative interpretation remains the same. K bigger than one favors the products, K less than one favors the reactants. But quantitatively, they will have different values. And this may be troubling, um, but what I want to assure to you is that even though you have different values for the uh, equilibrium constant, because the standard state is different, you're referring to different states of the system. If you calculate the composition at the same state, you get the same value. Okay. Um, so it's all an internally way, consistent way to do it. You just have to note carefully what you're talking about. All right, I'm gonna start here or stop here. Um, there are some quick problems associated with defining equilibrium constants and using reaction quotients. I'm also going to post some videos about two common types of problems that we solve in these chemical equilibriums. Um, so take a look at those problems uh, and watch the next video about solving ice problems, basically, and we'll go from there. See ya.